Okay, so this is going to be the bio, psych, and history of science. So I'll start with the two quick ones, those two psych. So here's Piaget's, the child's conception of the world. Um, I don't have a lot of Piaget's stuff, and actually, I think a lot of his stuff is not published by... Obviously, he was French, and everything has to be translated in English, but I haven't found a lot of books written by him. I found a lot more books written on his stuff by other people. And I do have a couple of his books, and then, of course, I have a few books on him. But I found those a lot more numerous. But anyways, I did find this for free, um, Child's Concept of the World. Recently, I've been looking into that, um, how children construct reality. What is in the mind prior to birth that helps the child figure out how this world works metaphysically? So we're talking about cause and we're not talking about gravity. We're not talking about there are beds. We're not talking about there are colors. We're talking about metaphysical reality in terms of there are causes and effects that come out of those causes. How that how does a baby figure that out? And so does that suggest that there are some predetermined ideas in the child's brain about expectations of the world they're born into? That's a giant question in in well, I was gonna say psychology, but not in not really in psychology, more in theory of mind. Um, of course, there's a traditional tabula rasa concept that suggested by John Locke that the brain, the mind is blank in respect of that there is no knowledge built in, but the question still remains of what ideas are built in. If you are a philosophical rationalist like Plato, like Immanuel Kant, then you argue that the brain has innate ideas already built in. If you are not, if you are an empiricist type like John Locke, then you will suggest that the brain is open to its world and it's impressionable in the nearly unlimited sense. And then how you answer that question depends on where you are. Pull, is, it, is it fully unlimited or is it limited? How much, how impressionable can a child be? I'm sure everyone's heard of that phrase if you give me a child for the first seven years, I will make him whatever I want. I will make him a doctor. I will make him a plumber. I will make him a dentist, you know, whatever. Um, so that's a question of how impressionable is a child's mind socially, but there also is the question metaphysically. What is already predetermined in the child's brain? What expectations are already there of the world they're going to be in? Metaphysically, though. Okay, here's another one I thought was a great find, actually. Uh, it's called Flow. The Psychology of Optimal Experience. This is by uh, Cheek Sent Mahai. I remember that uh, phrasing because in my master's, I was doing a lot of research in creativity. And he's a guy in creativity, certainly. So um, flow is, is exactly what it sounds like. You get in the moment. You, the creativity is a flow in the brain. And so that's, I'm, I'm really glad to have that uh, book. Okay, so now a couple on science, history of science, and there's kind of one on philosophy of science. Now here's history of science. Uh, it's called A Short History of Scientific Ideas to 1900 by Charles Singer. Um, this is, I've got quite a few on history of science now. I probably don't need any more. Um, but this should do me. This should be it. Um, so I'm really glad to have this because, of course, we're talking about this this uh, starts in Egypt, Mesopotamia, actually, and goes all the way through um, Rome and theology, Middle Ages. And, all, and it says, return to antiquity, the rise of humanism. So that, of course, is the Enlightenment and uh, Renaissance, all that stuff. So this is great. Um, a lot of the early... Greeks um, talked about natural philosophy, which is early science, and they had these interesting ideas about atoms, and yet they had no electron microscopes. They had no way of looking at that, no way of determining that. Purely by philosophy, they thought of atoms. They're called atomists. And I thought that's just amazing. They had no tools, and yet they could think logically about how can there be space? Are materials infinitely divisible? Um, questions like that, you can 
come to the conclusion that there must be atoms. There's not a plenum, which is one of the theories in early science, that everything is the same stuff. Um, it's all like the same mist. It's everything is the same, and we're just moving. And we don't even really move. We just, when we move, we just change, the, our, ourselves just become into a different space. And those, that new space just flicks on to what we are. Uh, as opposed to actually moving and pushing air away, all that kind of stuff, they were able to derive that that the world is made of atoms. They just think it's amazing. How could they have done that? Here's more on philosophy of science. What are the boundaries of science? And this gets into um, something I also was kind of interested in lately is science, science is empirical. It gives us basis of fact related to the world and reality. Um, but what about moral questions and ethical questions? Do they have a basis in fact? Or are they a humanist question? Are they a holistic question? Um, what are the limits of science? And as this book is, what are the boundaries of science? So the reason is that that's an important question is because could, is it possible to have too much science? Um, is it possible that science can um, disrupt questions that are actually philosophical questions and not scientific questions? Um, what happens if science oversteps its limitations? If Are there limitations? So it's an interesting question because I think around the mid-20th century, at least in education, there was a, a belief that behaviorist psychology was overrunning education and causing a lot of problems, um, it was far beyond its reaches and what it could possibly be applying to education. So it again begs the question of what the limits of science are. What is the proper place of science in the world, in technology, in public opinion, in making decisions in government, all those kinds of things. Um, it brings back kind of the is ought in David Hume that just because you state a fact doesn't mean that we should do it. So you come up with these psychology theories about how the mind works and how learning works, and yet we have to ask the question still, okay, but are we still going to use these concepts? Is it still important for what we're doing? Um, okay, you found out that a certain kind of instructional strategy um, increases achievement in the classroom, but does that, we still have to ask the question whether we're going to use that knowledge, whether we're going to use that instructional strategy. Perhaps there are better ones. Perhaps the instructional strategy is not ethical. Um, like, I'll give you an absurd example. So, you have a classroom, and there's kids that are throwing erasers, right? So, someone does an experiment and says, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to tie the arms of all the kids behind their seats. We're going to tie their arms behind their seats so they can't throw erasers anymore. And we found from that result, that experiment of tying people's hands behind their seats, that eraser throwing went to zero. Wow, that's wonderful. That's an empirical finding. Are we going to do that in the classroom? Is that ethical? Well, no. So you see, the the is the 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 empirical result, the fact, is not enough to establish that we're going to use it. Not not enough to establish its efficacy. So, again, the boundaries of science are an important question. Here's a um, I'm not, I have no idea what it's about actually. This is a I think it's biology. Uh, the panda's thumb. More Reflections in Natural History. Uh, Steve, Stephen J. Gould is a writer on biology. I, I, I think he wrote The Mismeasure of Man, which I think is about IQ. Um, but it's a very nice book, and it was expensive. So, But I'm not, not actually sure what it's about. Maybe I'll just, I'll just take a second here and find out. So it looks like the book is about evolution. And it seems like he's kind of leveling a bit with the public in terms of how they're using evolutionary theory. It talks about the history of evolutionary theory. And it looks like he's suggesting that the use of evolution in in the public, the public understanding of evolution has gone too far. And he's kind of trying to find the limits of of what kind of conclusions one can make from evolution and um, kind of curb back misinterpretations and misuses of the theory. 
So it seems like kind of a cleaning up book, a book that's supposed to uh, clarify and um, yeah. So that looks good. Here is level four virus hunters of the CDC. So the CDC is the what? Center for Disease Control. I had to think about it myself for five seconds. Um, by McCormick and Fisher Hotch. Um, it's funny, I saw this book a long time ago on a website called Edward Hamilton Books in the U.S. Unfortunately, they won't, they won't ship to Canada, so I just left it in a shopping cart in there when I was looking through the stuff because they have really cheap stuff. But now I found it up here in Canada, so I, I have a copy of it. So I don't have anything to do with viruses or the Center for Disease Control. So, And I've, I've played the board game Pandemic a few times, so I'm interested in that. So I'm glad to have that. Okay, last few are bio, specifically Darwin, but specifically Richard Dawkins. So here's the first one, Richard Dawkins' River Out of Eden. I believe this is just a collection of essays. Um, a little bit of water damage, unfortunately, with this book, but oh well. I guess I haven't been doing dates. Oh well. I don't think anyone really cares. Um, yeah, this is just a, a collection of essays. So here's the the bigger one, though. Here's the more more well known one. Found this. I think it was five bucks. So, but I paid it because it it was it's brand new. It looks brand new, anyways. Uh, the Greatest Show on Earth. So this is about evolution. This is basically Richard Dawkins saying, The greatest show on Earth, the most obvious thing in the world, is evolution. Here's all the evidence, um, period. Like, end of discussion with creationism. That's what he's saying. And his color, he's got color photos in here. It's wonderful. It's a wonderfully put together book. And here's Darwin. I have a few of these, actually. I was at a... I, there was a new used bookstore, not I shouldn't say new, but it was one I hadn't been to before that I didn't know existed. And so I went there with some people and we picked up uh, stuff. And I picked up a few of these are called Britannica Great Books. Uh, this one's Darwin. The reason why I picked this one up is because, although I already have the origin of species, um, I was looking for the descent of man. By the way, you should know, and I didn't actually know this until, I don't know, maybe a year ago or something. The origin of species is only on animals, non-human animals. He doesn't talk about humans, I don't think, anyways, in The Origin of Species. Where he talks about the origins of man is from, the, it's called the descent of man. That's where he starts getting into human beings now, instead of just non-human animals. So the descent of man I've been looking for and haven't been able to find, this book has it. So that's great. So I'm glad to have it. Okay, uh, next, that's it for science, psych, and biology. Next will be education, and a mix of that, media, sociology stuff.